Hey everybody, welcome to episode 12 of Golf News or I, the podcast, our rebranded podcast. Thanks everybody for tuning in and checking out the previous episodes that you can find on golfnewsri.com. Uh, something a little bit different for this episode, talking about the business of golf, uh, which I think most people think is fascinating. And to do that, we bring in Steve Ekovich. He's the executive and managing director of Leisure Investment Properties Group, who just issued a report uh, late last week or midweek last week about uh, the the business side of golf, and we'll get into a bunch of things with him. So, Steve, thank you so much for taking a few minutes to talk to me. Really appreciate it. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here, and I look forward to our conversation. So, uh, just to start with, uh, just talk a little bit about you know your group, Leisure Investment Properties. You were formerly the National Golf and Resort Properties Group, but just give people a little bit of background on on your company, on your group, and kind of what you guys uh, do, kind of in general. Sure. So in commercial real estate, there's um, income property brokerage, which is selling apartment buildings, shopping centers, office buildings, and all those things have leases. Um, we are in the business oriented real estate, which are leisure properties. So golf is a business. It just happens to have land connected. Marina's the same thing. Uh, we do um, boutique hospitality like in Myrtle Beach, you know, and in Hilton Head and in Key West, which is a great place to go. And then we do the same thing with RV parks because sometimes RV parks have golf courses, they have marinas. So we're really involved in things that are leisure pursuits that are classified more as businesses than uh, a commercial real estate classification. And we are the largest group in the country that does this. So we have um, 12 agents that focus on, on this discipline. Uh, most of the other companies will have one guy that does golf or one guy that does marinas. And um, we uh, we are headquartered in Tampa and we work all over the country. Uh, we've sold from on the golf side, we sold a couple hundred golf courses all over the country, two and four, all the major owners in golf. Uh, some of your listeners are probably familiar with Invited, which used to be Club Corp. Uh, they're the largest owners, Arcus, Troon Golf, Kemper. Of course, they own the Kemper course. Uh, and then we work with you know, Chinese, Koreans, uh, people from Kuala Lumpur, believe it or not, Germans. We uh, sold a uh, property in Orlando last year in two weeks to a German group. So, and we sold it for a Korean group. So we're agnostic to who we work for, but we are golf course uh, brokers and advisors. Yeah, so really interesting. Like I said, you guys issued a report last week or so, and we'll hyperlink the report in the article that goes along with uh, this podcast so people can check that out if they would like and uh, I thought overall it was really interesting like I said the business of golf is fascinating and in golf I think is in a is in a great spot uh, both play wise and financially wise uh, it seems like uh, just talk about I mean you just hinted at it a little bit we, we are familiar with some of the management companies that you mentioned but just talk about kind of golf business right now in general you guys had a couple of things to a couple of observations of what to look forward to in 2024, obviously some reflection on 2023, but just the golf business in general right now. I mean, wh where do you see it? I think, yeah, I think this might be really interesting for your listeners because mm -hmm. golf has not been healthy for a long time. It is now. But for instance, if you bought a golf course in 2006 for $8 million, in 2012, it was worth $4 million. So, you know, if you can imagine buying a house that was worth 400000 and now it's worth 200000 it's not very palatable. And so um, what happened is during that time, it used to be said before the Great Recession in 2006 that golf was the last to go into recession and the first to come out. So that's all the previous recessions. Well, what happened in 2006 is we had the tiger effect. So people were buying homes in golf master plan communities. Uh, because they were interested in golf because of Tiger. They had lots of equity in their homes, so they used that to buy homes. And then real estate was doing so well, they were buying homes to flip them. Well, when the when the music stopped and musical chairs stopped, and all of a sudden we had these, we the, the bank failures and all the problems we had because these loans that were being packaged and sold were, were not rated, they're fake, it crashed the real estate market. So about 30% of the golf homes were in, on golf courses 
were not owned by people who lived in them, but investors. So that hurt the market and it hurt golf because all those golf courses were depending on those people to be members. And so they weren't getting dues revenue or, or green fees. So um, what happened is we started to lose about 200 net golf courses a year. We used to have about 16,000 18 hole equivalent golf courses. That means if you have a 27 hole course uh, in club in one place and a nine hole in another together, that would be two 18 hole equivalents. So uh, we were losing 200 a year. We lost about um, about 10% of our supply. And then the greatest thing to hit golf came right from heaven or from the Chinese. COVID. 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 So um, golf course owners from literally 2006 to 2018, they really weren't making any money in golf. Most of them were losing money. It was a bloodbath. Unless you were a really, really wealthy private club. But what happened is they couldn't raise their green fees because there were too many courses and their expenses were going up, right? Because people wanted raises and the cost of, of seed and sod and all that stuff. Well then um, because we continued to lose from 2007 to 2019, about 200 golf courses, we we're shrinking supply and all of a sudden COVID hit and people wanted to social distance. They wanted to be with their family. They wanted to get vitamin D and they wanted to be out and exercise and golf, bicycles, boating, and RVs were the perfect choices. Those were all the growth industries. So golf did 180, and uh, I can remember I was on a panel with um, some of the biggest names in golf. In fact, I was the moderator at a Golf Inc. conference. We had Troon, we had Club Corp, we had Arcus, uh, and we had um, Kemper. And uh, so in 2020, right? So we had 2019, we, get, we just went into COVID in 2020, end of 2020. Hey, how long is this COVID bump in golf going to be around? Because all of a sudden golf courses started being flooded with people. Mm -hmm. And all the pundits in the industry said, ah, well, you know, we'll probably get, give about 80% back. Well, then in 2021, the same thing. Oh, maybe we'll get 50% back. Then in 2022, it's like, there is no bump. This is how golf is now. We have more golfers than we have courses. And then what happened from 2021, 22, and 23, these courses that were unhealthy, that were losing money, got very healthy. If you look around the country right now, it's hard to find a private course that doesn't have a waiting list. So, you know, for golf course owners, that's important. And, and here's why your, your audience should care. Everybody wants to play on a nice course, right? So when you, when your course is struggling and you're, you're breaking even or losing money, guess what's the first thing people stop spending money on? Course maintenance. And that affects your play because now you're playing on a course with green's not so good or there's dirt in the fairways. So now that courses are getting healthy, you're like, oh my God, I got to pay a higher green fee, right? Or higher dues. But now they're putting money back into the courses. I mean, right now in private courses, there's an arms race. There are courses right now putting 20, 30, and $40 million into remaking their courses. Yeah, it's it's pretty amazing. And here, here in Rhode Island, I think almost all of our private courses have a wait list of some sort. Even the nine hole courses that we have that are private or semi-private, even those have wait lists for membership. So it's really uh, amazing. But it's interesting you said about the COVID boom, because that's something that we still hear about all the time. We hear it written about, talked about. So you're, you're, you don't think, you don't believe that the COVID boom is still going. You think this is just golf now. This is just, we're kind of over the over the COVID boom, did I misunderstand what you were saying? Because I think yes, that's- Yes, we, we don't believe that this is a bubble from COVID. What right. we believe okay. is that this is the new normal because of this. Okay. We had people who gave up golf, came back to golf and started playing again. We had, um, because of the baby boomers, there's 70 million retiring a day. Um, they are playing more golf. Uh, and then we have these things called off course golf courses or practice ranges like top golf and simulators and they are becoming feeders to green golf courses because you can imagine you know you go out for three or four times and you you're at top golf and you hit a golf ball into a into a cement hole after a while you're like well let's see what this is can i do this on a real course mm -hmm. and so it is becoming a feeder for golf courses for, for so those reasons we think and because we lost so much supply at the same time 
we're pretty confident that this is here to stay. The answer is no, you can't do that on a real course. It's not that easy. Uh, we just <laughs> topped off open in, in Rhode Island uh, back in October. And then virtual golf, indoor golf, has become a really big thing here and probably across the country. Uh, we did, Golf News Rise did two huge stories on indoor golf uh, back in November. We have about eight, I want to say seven or eight, like strictly indoor golf facilities with simulators, track man, and all that stuff. And that's another thing I wanted to, uh, that was a, you must have read my notes. Uh, the indoor golf business, or the virtual golf business, obviously technology as well. I, I mean, th it seems like it kind of came out of nowhere um, as far as how big it's gotten. Uh, the technology sort of didn't come out of nowhere, but it seems like that business kind of kind of came out of nowhere a little bit, just as far as how big it's how big that how big that's become over the last couple of years. I think the genesis of that was really from the Far East. Do you know in Korea they have more simulators probably than we have golf courses by five to one? They're everywhere. Really? Oh, and shit. same thing in Japan. Um, so in any places where you're starved for real estate simulators work new york city is getting them new jersey's getting them you know so um and then the other uh, corollary to that is you're in cold weather half the year right so mm -hmm. to be able to practice your game and have a couple drinks with friends it's it's an amazing so what's happened is out of the golf shows there's literally 15 or 20 when we go to the uh um in january every year is the merchandise the golf merchandise show yep um, have, show. You, have you talked yep. to your readers about that uh, yeah, we we I've never been, but we we um write about it a little bit just for what local businesses are down there and stuff. But we know we know about it, yeah the PGA. Yeah, so it's it's the yeah. largest it's the largest golf show in the world. People from all over the world, every country in the world are represented, and so you know you have um, all these golf simulators over there, and then you know the people from the from Far East are talking about they've got leagues and how it's going, and so you know things have gravitated to the United States. The technology's gotten better. It's gotten cheaper. And, you know, for private clubs, um, the idea is how do I get a member besides just coming to eat to spend time at the club and spend money? And simulators is one of the ways. Yeah, we're saying that in Rhode Island with, uh, especially with the off season, they put the simulators in in their clubs. My club has one or, or had one. I think it's closed now for the season, but we had one in the winter and other clubs have done the same thing. So I just find the simulator business uh, amazing because these clubs, these places, especially around here, I mean, probably just in general, you have to kind of kill it over the winter because over the summer, in theory, people are going outdoors. So I just find that whole, I don't really understand it necessarily, um, but as far as the business perspective, but I mean, it just seems, um, it's just amazing how much it's grown. We uh, uh, work with one of them here. Uh, just the simulator business is a fascinating business, and I don't think it's going to go anywhere because technology is only going to get better. In theory, right. yep, I agree with you. And then um, you know that I think which will blow it up even more is Tiger Woods and TGL thing. Yes, or... exactly. Yeah. yeah, I mean that's basically a simulator. Yeah, they just announced uh, was it Monday or this weekend that they're officially opening in in January of 2025, after their whole facility collapsed <laughs> a handful of months ago. It was supposed to be already open, but now they, they've announced the other day, or whatever it was, that they're officially opening in 2025. So that will blow it up more as well. Um, one of the things we, we started talking about, and people will be familiar with it, was the, the golf management companies. You're seeing a lot of clubs uh, bring on management companies. And I thought it was really interesting uh, you guys point out kind of the positives and negatives of that. Um, we, we are familiar with uh, Concert Golf, Escalante. They do the international up in Bolton, Massachusetts, obviously. Uh, Troon, we have, a, I think, a couple of, one or two Troon courses in Rhode Island. Uh, but just the, the the benefits and the, the negatives of management companies, I just thought that was really interesting because we've I hear about some of that. Uh, from from members that I talk to that I'm friends with that I play golf with, you know, the it's kind of you know obviously the benefits. Some of the notable ones I point I uh, took out of the the study uh, was the marketing and branding, financial management obviously is a big one, even resources. But the negatives I took out were cost and just generic operations, which I've heard from people on regarding some of the some of those uh, management companies in in Rhode Island and in the Northeast. 
just talk about a little bit about management companies and where uh, you see that going or maybe not going uh, in, in the future. And I, I, again, I just thought the benefits and the, the 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 drawbacks that you guys pointed out were really interesting. And we, like I said, we're familiar with a bunch of them here up in, in Rhode Island. Well, so there are really only two major management companies left. There's some small local and regional guys. The only two real true management companies are Troon and Kemper. So Troon has bought up Billy Casper and a bunch of guys. Um, Concert Golf is a good client. They are ownership group. Um, they recapitalize clubs by bringing money to the table so that they can fix the CapEx and, and then they own the club. Same thing with Heritage and Invited and Escalante. They're all our clients. And in fact, they're all in our, in our uh, report here. Mm -hmm. So what's really, and it might be interesting to talk about the distinction between the two. Right. Because a management company um, should not cost the owner money. So typically, they're going to charge a percentage of the gross revenue. However, if they're not bringing in business because of their marketing, if they're not lowering your costs because they can have the ability to buy at a discount from national suppliers, if they're not able to at least break even, then you shouldn't have them, right? So that, that's my theory. The management company um, should be with best practices, be able to give you better programming, better conditions on the course because they have backups uh, and they have a bench. So somebody, you know, your GM gets sick or leaves. What do you do, right? So, well, if you have a management company, they can bring from another course one of the GMs down or, or the superintendents or whoever it is the, the, because they have bench. Um, the disadvantage is I've seen management companies go in where the gross income of the course, that's all income, is a million two and the expenses are 2.2 million. They're running a million dollar negative. So yeah, it, it, it's crazy, right? I've seen it happen twice on courses we've sold. So the, the thing for management companies is they don't have any skin in the game. So if you're the owner, Joe, of a course mm -hmm. and you hire a management company and they go, well, hey, Joe, you know, we need to fix the clubhouse. We need $200,000. They go, Joe, hand over the check. They don't yeah. pay for any of that. Um, so that's the thing is you're still in charge of all the CapEx. With an ownership group, when an ownership group comes in, if there's a hole in the clubhouse roof, guess who pays for it? They do. And they have skin in the game because they put $2 million, $3 million, $5 million, $10 million into the course to buy it. Plus, to protect their investment, they're going to continue to reinvest CapEx in the course. Now you might say, oh, geez, you know, uh, you know, Joe, you and 100 guys owned the course. It was an equity course. Well, if you don't own it, so what? What did you really want? You want to hang out with your buddies. You want to drink some brewskis. You want to go play golf and have a good time and have a place that's safe for your family. You have that, whether you own it or someone else owned it. What you don't have is some member complaining to you, Joe, I had cold soup, and Joe, um, I didn't get my tea time I wanted. So you get relieved of all that. So I'm a big fan of ownership over management, but there are times when management companies do a really great job, and Troon and Kemper are two of the best in the industry. Yeah, it's uh, like I said, we have a couple of those. Troon for one. I don't know if there's a Kemper course in our area. There could be, um, but Troon for sure. Um, one thing that I thought was interesting, and you hit on it a little bit, um, but I noticed I was looking at the prices of golf course sales over the years. And I, you you mentioned like 2006, they were they were selling for nearly $8 million around rounding up. and But then it kind of dipped down to almost... 3 million in 2012. Now it's kind of a little bit, seems to have gone back up um, the average sale price. I think it's about close to 5 million now. Uh, what, what causes that? Is that, oh, you talked about the recession. So that's part of it. But do you see it continuing to, the numbers to continue to climb back up over the yeah, next I mean, couple of years? Courses, the golf courses, like other assets, are based on your net income. And so it's your income minus your expenses. So it's your net operating income right before debt. And if that goes up, the way golf courses and other businesses are valued are on a multiple of that net income. So 
you might say, well, why are my green fees going up every year? Well, when your green fees go up every year, your course is more worth more and you could sell it for more. And also they're getting more cash flow, and that's the objective. So one of the interesting things is, is, and listen, this happens to owners of golf courses, to people in management companies, people all over the industry. What's the right way to own a golf course? I know an owner who has a bunch of investors and he owns a bunch of golf courses. They're very, very, they're not in good condition. He has his GM, who's the director of golf and the spray tech all at the same time. Uh, he doesn't have a lot of staff. He makes a mint off the golf courses, but they're not in great condition. Now I've got other owners that make hardly any money and their golf courses are beautiful and pristine. As a golfer, you want to play the pristine golf course, right? Absolutely. <laughs> but who's the better one to be an investor of? The guy who's making a ton of money for you or the guy that's not making any money. So there's really a balance in golf between providing a good quality condition of course and spending too much. And then you lose your people because you don't have a condition and the golf course owners and management companies that know where that balance is, know where those two lines cross are the best owners and operators. Fascinating stuff. Uh, two more things, and I'll, I'll let you get out of here. When you guys were putting this report together, obviously you put a ton of work to, into it, a ton of data, a ton of research, uh, et cetera. Was there anything that surprised you that you were like, whoa, when you when you kind of put the report together, anything kind of jump out like that you weren't expecting or or anything of that type? Um, you know, we every year we kind of take a forecast and we're we're pretty good at forecasting what we think is going to happen for the next year um the one thing that did jump out at me which was I, I was a little shocked is that the number of transactions were down and the median price was down so you've got the average and the median so if you have um 10 golf course sales the median is the one in the middle of those numbers from you know, one to one to six uh, or one to five and six to 10 and one in the middle. The average can be influenced by a couple high sales or a couple really low sales. So I was surprised that the median didn't come up more um, because values of golf courses have gone up because of what we talked about. Green fee. Well, we didn't talk about it, but mm -hmm. if you have a waiting list, I guarantee your dues have gone up. Your initiation fees have gone up. If you have a public course and you went from 30,000 rounds to 50,000 rounds, your green fees have gone up. So since the revenue has gone up and it had to, because th think about it, everybody's salary has gone up, you know, nationally, um, the minimum wage has gone up. Um, so, you know, I expected that median price to go up. I do have a funny story that I think your, your listeners will, will like. So right. I sold a 36 holes in Oakmont, uh, in Oakmont, in Rosedale, California, in Roseville, in the wine country. And um, I'm talking to the superintendent. I said, hey, do you have any problems with, you know, the guys on your staff? He goes, yes. I go, well, what's the problem? He goes, pot. And I go, oh, that's right. Pot's legal here. They're all smoking pot. He goes, hell no. They're working in the pot fields and getting $20 an hour when we're paying them $15 an hour to cut grass. <laughs> so what did you ever think pot fields would com compete for people who work on golf courses? I don't know the I don't know pot fields, but it seems like uh, people are trying to find are having trouble finding people to work just in general in some That's in true. some places. That's um, true. Uh, maybe everyone's on a pot field. Who really knows? Maybe there's pot fields <laughs> around here. Um, you guys, you said you guys are really good at forecasting things coming up, and that's it's obvious. Um, just give a, give us a few predictions for for 2024 as here in the New England, here in Rhode Island. We're hopefully going to start our golf season soon. It's still cold out for some reason, um, but hopefully our golf season is starting soon here. Uh, give us some predictions for 2024, whether it's nationally or or worldwide or whatever, whatever you uh, think is necessary. But what what do you see happening? Well, um, you know, I, I can tell you that you'll continue to see consolidation in ownership and in golf course management. Um, it's very difficult to be a single owner and compete out there because you pay retail for everything. So it's difficult to make the golf course make fiscal sense. So you'll continue to see a consolidation of management companies, managing courses and or ownerships. Um, F&B will continue to 
uh, a really strong um, revival from pre-COVID, but labor costs are high and it's still tough to find people. Um, I, I think, you know, if you look at any, almost any restaurant, service is really slow because there's not enough wait staff, right? So um, you'll see golf courses value continue to go up. Um, I, uh, there are, one of the things that was happening a few years ago was the hottest thing in golf courses were golf course conversions. And that is a golf course that would convert to single family homes. And those were because they were struggling golf courses. Um, that's all but dried up. It's going to be very weak because the golf courses that were struggling are not struggling anymore because of, of COVID. Um, and um, the equity, there were a lot of equity clubs that were struggling and concert golf was famous for this. They bought struggling equity clubs, pump three, four, five million into them and fix them. Um, well, they're healthy. So there's going to be less equity clubs trading hands. But um, look, we have some headwinds. We've got a you know, Ukraine war. Uh, and if Russia wins there, then China is likely to go into Taiwan, which means we could be pulled in. You've got what's going on over in Israel. We've got a presidential election. So there's a lot of stuff out there that could very quickly change our fortunes. But right now, we're all blessed to be in the golf industry and have great golf courses to play. Yeah, I, we're in the toy department, as they say. And hopefully, yes. <laughs> hopefully I, I try, to, try to stay there for the most part. But listen, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. It was really fascinating. Uh, like I said, I'm certainly not a financial expert, so hopefully uh, I'll ask decent questions and <laughs> you, you gave great answers to all of them. But uh, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. And, and the best of luck to your own golf season in, in 2024. I'm sure... You're down in Florida, so I'm sure you've played already. But uh, I but... have, but thank you so much. Take care. Awesome. That's Steve Ekovich. This is the Golf News Rider Podcast, Episode 12, and we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.